I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Eric Hazeltine, an author, futurist, and neuroscientist. He's held several senior executive positions in private industry and the public sector. He was the associate director and CTO of the National Intelligence, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the Director of Research at the National Security Agency, an executive vice president at Walt Disney Imagineering, and a director of engineering at Hughes Aircraft Company. For the past few years, he's been developing completely new forms of digital media, entertainment, and advertising, in addition to cutting-edge cyber and industrial security solutions. Eric has authored or co-authored 15 patents in optics, special effects, and electronic media. In addition, he's published over 100 articles in Discover Magazine, on Discover.com, and in journals such as Brain Research and Society for Neuroscience Proceedings. He maintains a blog on Psychology Today as well. Eric's book, Long Fuse Big Bang, shows how to prevent the tyranny of the urgent from trumping the personal pursuit of the important. He is also the co-author of The Listening Cure with Dr. Chris Gilbert. So Eric, welcome back. It is a true pleasure and honor to have you with us again today, sir. Oh, thanks. Always fun, Tim. Well, so UFOs have been part of American culture for 75 years now, featured in hundreds, if not thousands, of movies, television shows, print publications, internet memes, and pretty much every other type of media out there. It's a fascinating and mysterious part of American culture. I think that's why it is so captivating for us. But that could also make it fertile ground for use in foreign espionage. So I understand that this is part of the premise of a new book that you are working on with your wife. So let me start out by asking if you could give me kind of a quick overview of the book concept. Thanks, Tim. The book is called The New Science of UFOs, Understanding the Mystery. And what we do is look at the UFO phenomena through a new lens that people haven't used before. And the new lens is uh, kind of takes a neuroscience psychological perspective. And one of the questions we ask, for example, that's new, is what if we have all the data we're ever going to have or that's useful on UFOs? We just don't know what we're looking at. What if UFOs are to us what an iPhone would be to cave people? We could see it, touch it, smell it, kind of watch what it does, but we have no clue why it does what it does or actually how it does. And we have to accept that that's a possibility. And also what we do in the book is we look at cognitive biases that might, for example, make us think these are flying objects as opposed to things that aren't objects at all. And so we surface all of that and uh, we look systematically at all the possible explanations from all the different kinds of aircraft and propulsion systems that are either available now or on the drawing boards. We look at optical illusions. We look at um, uh, effects such as, um, you know, atmospheric effects, all lightning, things like that. And uh, then what we try to do is assess with all these possibilities what seems the most likely and what still can't be explained. Ah, okay. Well, I, I want to get into some numbers here. A series of 2019 and 2021 Gallup polls indicate that 41% of Americans believe that, quote-unquote, some UFOs have been alien spacecraft. 68% believe that the government knows more about UFOs than it's telling us. And 75% believe that, quote-unquote, life of some form exists elsewhere in the universe. So these numbers do not prove that UFOs are real or extraterrestrial, but they do tell us that a lot of Americans believe in them. Could this belief be manipulated for nefarious means? Yes, uh, it certainly could. Um, and we go into a chapter on faking that covers exactly this possibility. Um, and you say, well, why would someone want to fake a UFO up in the sky when we're not talking about faking photographs, which has been done quite a bit? Uh, we're talking about faking it so that if you were there and you were looking at it, you go, holy mackerel. What's that up in the sky? That kind of fakery. And um, I approached this problem 
from the point of view of someone who used to make a living, living faking things at Walt Disney Imagineering, you know, our job was to do things that were like magic and that were thought to be impossible. And the way we do that at Disney is to <clears throat> metaphorically walk on water by stepping on stones. I'll give you an example. Uh, one time Tom Clancy, the famous author, came through our lab and we showed him our most cool stuff. And one of the things was this huge floating hologram, three-dimensional video real-time hologram. And he looked at that and he goes, oh my God, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. You've got to give that to the U.S. military for command and control. And of course, we never did, even though he kept pestering us for weeks to do that, because we completely faked it. We controlled the viewing angles, we controlled the backstory, we controlled everything like a magician to make you think you were seeing something that in fact you were not seeing. So with all of that background, I know how possible it is to really fake people out if you know what you're doing. And you know, so that raises the question, well, why would someone do that? And now we get into the murky world of military operations and geopolitical influence. Uh, here are some reasons why someone might want to fake UFOs. One is they don't want them to be attributed to them, so they want them to be unidentified. And why would they want to put them out there? Well, a lot of the UFOs, it turns out, show up around training ranges and test ranges for the U.S. military. And there are reasons for this. One could be sample bias, that that's where pilots are, they can see things. But it could also be that civilians who see flying things over ranges that they don't know are ranges because they're not near any airport uh, would say, oh, if there's something flying there where nothing's supposed to be flying, therefore it's a UFO. But it could also be that a lot of the UFOs show up around those ranges because it's espionage or other activities of foreign adversaries. So let me give you some examples of why someone would do that. Let's suppose you want to see how we, the U.S., are going to respond to an airborne threat. You want to see which aircraft do we scramble, what sensors can see them, at what range, how do we communicate when we are trying to coordinate our air defenses. Uh, can we be fooled into thinking that these things are out there? So uh, in the intelligence gathering business, this is called a pulse and probe operation. In other words, you don't passively wait to collect information you cause information to be surfaced by causing your adversary to do things that you can then watch. So those are called pulse and probe or ferret type operations. And another uh, reason you might do it is an interesting one that falls under the category of what the Russians call maskirovka, which is you don't have to have a weapon to intimidate and deter an opponent you only have to have your opponent think you have that weapon. So, for example, there is a rumor that some years ago, 30 or 40 more years ago, just so happened that when one of our overhead satellites was going over Lake Baikal, it captured a rocket torpedo that the Soviets were testing that went something like 500 knots. I mean, some ungodly fast uh, per a torpedo in the water. And that really opened some eyes, so the rumor goes. They said, we have no defense against this. We got to have one of these other, and we have to defend against it, which could be exactly what the Russians intended. You know, they could have, quote, walked on water by stepping on stones, creating a demo that looked like that. So we go off and panic, spend a lot of money on something that wasn't actually real. Um, and so if you're the Russians, for example, and you don't have the budget that your adversary, us, have, one of your strategies is going to be to get us to waste money and effort and time on things that actually aren't going to get us anywhere. And that's the whole value of Maskirovka. So if you think about these things, you know, they're planting in our mind the idea that, oh, there's these weird flying objects out there. So let's suppose combat erupts in Eastern Europe between NATO and Russia. And our pilots start seeing these things. 
it would have already been programmed in their brain that, oh, we know these things, these fly in impossible ways. So we might go chase after them and waste precious resources when in fact they're just illusions. Um, so that would be, and, you know, in the military affairs, Sun Tzu said many, you know, thousands of years ago, all war is deception. Make people think you're close when you're far, small when you're large, large when you're small, uh, far when you're close. Um, that war is all about deception. And you look at what's happening in Ukraine, where they're using decoys of all kinds and spoofing of all kinds. This is the way war is. So we could be seeing what uh, in the military and intelligence world we talk about as shaping operations. It could be conditioning us so that if war breaks out, we'll already expect these things and be scared by them and it would be intimidated. That's the other thing. If we really thought the Russians had this stuff, in particular like the uh, Tic Tac that the Navy observed in 2004 off of San Diego where reputedly it dropped from low Earth orbit to 80,000 feet in a second or two and then took off and accelerated and turned and stopped in impossible ways, if we thought someone had a weapon like that, we might think twice about going up against them. Well, and you know, Eric, so, so those would be reasons to fake this stuff. You know, one thing I want to interject, because a large portion of my audience does believe that UFOs are extraterrestrial in origin. But I, I think that really one of the salient points here is we're saying it, it could be that and right and that's what makes it such a concern is that espionage could be basically tailgating off an existing phenomena it is tailgating off an existing phenomena so that may be extraterrestrial it may be something completely different we don't know that's what arrow is investigating currently but i think the concern is that we are so focused on it you know and it's this everybody knows that ufos are extraterrestrial and that's not necessarily the case. What you're saying is it's very easy to slip in espionage and impersonate that through uh, Maskarovka, right? Yeah, I don't know how easy it would be. And I get into that, we get into that in the book. Um, but I want to make a point here. It isn't just terrestrial adversaries that may be messing with us. It could be ETs doing this. You know, ask yourself the question. If they had an adversary or an ET, some technology that was far advanced of what we had, would it be more likely that they could use that technology to fake UFOs or to actually create UFOs? You know, logic says that if you, you have some kind of advanced technology that may not be propulsion or flight, but may be, for example, holographic projection or things like holographic projection, you could use that advanced technology to fake incredible performance much easier than you could actually achieve that performance. And so maybe ETs are here and they want to test our defenses. So the fact that these things might be quote unquote fake doesn't mean that they're terrestrial origin. Um, so I think that is really important to keep in mind. And the other really important thing to keep in mind when you talk about fakery is there isn't such a thing as the UFO phenomena. It's yeah, yeah. multiple phenomena. If you look at the AARO report, about 30% are moving lights of some kind or hovering lights, about 35% are orbs or spheres, about you know a few percent are rectangular, triangular, tic-tac-shaped, uh, and then there are some that they are just not described at all. So what we're dealing with is almost certainly not a single phenomena, but multiple possibly unrelated phenomena. Well, and, and I, um, I love the I love the fact that you were going into the psychology of this as well. I think that is so important and it has been so neglected. I mean, again, this has been part of our culture. We already have I mean, 75 years of cultural programming about, you know, perceptually what we think a UFO is, and we have all this kind of emotional and intellectual baggage that comes with it, and it, it just seems like it would be so easy to take advantage of that and subvert that. that That's right. 
Yeah. That's right. That's right. And, uh, I, you know, but, but all of this raises the question, of course. Well, we've discussed many different reasons why people might want to fake UFOs. But the question then is, how could they do it? So uh, my wife and I, when we were thinking about this, we sat down and made a long list and said, if somebody gave us unlimited budget like a nation state might have, how would we do it? We say, we say, take these UFOs, especially the really astonishing ones, like the ones over the Pacific or in 2015, uh, the Theodore Roosevelt of the Atlantic, and say, go at it, fake them. So the first thing I would do is I would use what are called laser plasmas. Uh, when I was at Disney, we developed some artificial fireworks. And basically, think of it as a very high-intensity laser that you bring to a focus with such intensity that it turns the air into a plasma. Mm. Essentially, we create something like ball lightning or set the air on fire in little balls, right? And it is like ball lightning. It is a plasma that's created by a very strong electric field. And so the thing is, you can move those things around just like any laser light show. And, you know, those lasers move so fast, you can't see them moving. And essentially, a plasma, which is a glowing ball of light, has no mass and can be moved instantly pretty much anywhere at any velocity you want. It can also disappear all of a sudden. And so the U.S. Navy, curiously enough, has a patent application which has been made public. Now, why it isn't classified, I don't know. But I'm not the only one thinking this way. The Navy actually has a patent on faking out enemy anti-air systems such as infrared seeking missiles by drawing the outline or the volume of a jet somewhere away from the actual jet that's being shot at so that the missile will track onto that versus the jet. These plasmas give off heat signatures and they reflect radar. So if someone gave me the task of faking a UFO, that would be the first thing I would do. Now, that isn't going to explain all of them because the plasmas put out a ton of light yeah. and a ton of other things too, like RF interference and uh, things of that nature. So uh, that would only be one way of doing it. But I asked a friend who is probably the world's expert in drones and using drones for entertainment. I said, uh, if you were going to fake one of these things, how would you do it? And he says, well, I have done it. And he went on to explain how he did it. But one of the ways he did it, and this gets back to the psychology, is the brain focuses on the thing that's the shiny object, the most salient object, and it ignores everything else. Now, for example, I don't know, your listeners may have heard of the famous example where they showed people dribbling a basketball and asked them to count how many times the basketball was passed in this video, and they tried to do it. And then later someone said, did you see the gorilla that came in in the middle of this? And then what gorilla? And if you replay it and you know to look for the gorilla, it's like obvious there's a gorilla. But if you're not focused on it, you're not going to see it. And so using that kind of trick that magicians use to deflect and focus you, uh, what my friend was saying is that you could take a really small drone and attach with a stiff column to a big white orb, especially at night, and you could fly the thing around and it would look like a big sphere flying around. And another way, you could actively mask the appearance of the drone by putting a very bright light at the top of the orb so that your vision would be reduced sensitivity with the light, like looking into the sun, you're not going to see anything. It'll just look like a big sphere with a light on top. Um, he said there's another way to do it where you could actually, if you really wanted the sphere to move around really fast, you could put very thin composite struts that were painted either sky color or at night black, and you could have little drones like quad or octocopters way out with the sphere at the center. And because the propellers are turning, you don't see them, and you could paint everything else to blend in with the background. Or if you did it at night, there's no way you'd see those. So um, those are some ways that you could fake some of the UFOs. Um, 
I will say, however, that as much as my wife and I tried, we couldn't think of ways of faking the ones that the Navy described because they didn't give off light. Um, we, we think we know how to fake slower versions of those using some pretty exotic technology that I think may be on the scope of, of this uh, podcast. But um, we just can't think of any way that you could fake what those Navy pilots saw. Well, going back to the espionage aspect of this, so I've reported uh, on hundreds of different UFO sightings across every step of our nuclear supply chain going back decades. This includes processing, refinement, storage facilities, transportation and logistics hubs, weapon silos, military bases, naval shipyards, carrier groups, and more. I mean, every single step of, of our nuclear supply chain, right? And so people who believe that UFOs are extraterrestrial sometimes offer this as a sign that maybe ET wants us to give up nuclear weapons, which I guess is possible. But in the context of intelligence gathering, these sightings seem a lot more ominous, don't they? Maybe. But I think um, my wife and I like to say when presented with a new idea, the answer should always be yo. Not yes, not no. But yo, maybe yes, maybe no. So let's go back and look at these nuclear sightings in the context of the sightings around uh, classified test ranges, like around Luke, Arizona and Area 51 and, and the various ranges in Nevada and elsewhere, China Lake and places like that. Um, one of the reasons they may be more reported there is there's more observers there. Mm. Right? And there are always going to be observers to make sure things go right around nuclear supply chain sites and activities, right? So you're going to have eyeballs there. And so you're going to report more of anything because you have more observers. So correlation does not imply causation, right? And, and as, that's one of the things that Chris and I, my wife, try to do in the book is try to constantly inject objective science into the equation. And so if you want to believe that there are aliens in UFOs, then it's really exciting to think, oh, yeah, they're spying on our nuclear. But we try very hard not to want or not want anything but to look at the data and to look at alternative explanations, such as the sample or reporting bias that I just talked about. Now, that said, we can't rule out that either foreign adversaries or ETs are looking at our nuclear capabilities. That's a possibility. So it shouldn't cause us to go too far overboard the other way either. You know, the bottom line is to keep an open mind and to never let go of your scientific principles and say, in God we trust, all others bring data. Yeah. Well, and again, it, it's the, the topic itself is so intriguing because, you know, I, I think myself included, we tend to go to the most fantastic explanations. Like, and as you've said, we, we tend to overlook, I guess, more mundane and the spoofing or faking aspect of it. Um, that's something that, you know, I mean, there's so much there. Now, during an interview published in Politico last November, Aero director Sean Kirkpatrick was asked if aliens are real. His response was, quote, unquote, that's a great question. I love that question. The best thing that could come out of this job is to prove that there are aliens, right? Because if we don't prove there are aliens, then what we're finding is evidence of other people doing stuff in our backyard, which isn't good. So would it be fair to say that, I mean, again, the head of Aero, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, is publicly voicing the same concern that you are. Yes, uh, but I would uh, caution that he, although I respect him a lot, and they're doing some great work there, uh, you, you can't come up with an artificially short list of alternatives. If we're not doing it, then some other artificial, meaning non-natural source, must be the cause of it. We have to also look at various atmospheric effects. And various neuroscience and optical illusion type effects. So let me just point out a couple things about natural phenomena for a moment. We're discovering new natural phenomena all the time that we didn't know about. For example, 
we have aurora borealis that we know are up around the poles, the Arctic Circle and the Antarctic Circle. Um, but there's also a brand new one called Steve, S-T-E-V-E, that is similar to the aurora, but it's at much more southerly or northerly latitudes. And people didn't even know that that existed before. And we're finding other phenomena too that weren't widely known, but turn out to actually be natural causes. Uh, most of these relate to some sort of plasma, but they're also uh, refractive weirdities. You know, for example, th there's a mirage called Fata Morgana, and it has to do with the bending of light. We all know that like if you put a pencil in a glass of water, you'll see the pencil bent because of what's called optical refraction. Well, under the right conditions of temperature and pressure and everything, the same can happen in the atmosphere. So that something's way over the horizon will actually pop up and appear to be floating in the sky. Mm. Um, and it's kind of what we call a superior mirage. Now that can't account for the UFOs that have been seen way above the horizon, but it can account for some. And as I said, um, there are some weird phenomena like uh, ignis fautis, it's phosphine gas that's uh, emitted and, and ignites when it combines with the oxygen over bogs and swamps. You know, there's all kind of these weird things that are out there. And I think it would be foolish for us to say uh, meteorologists, meteorologists have discovered everything there is to be discovered there, right? So just because we can't explain it now by any human technology, doesn't mean that it's artificial technology from someone else. It just means, as a scientist, all you can say about it is, what it means is we don't know what it is. And here's the thing um, that we talk about in the last chapter of the book where we get into non-human origins. Um, to say that something is not human and it has an intelligent origin, is not automatically to say that it can't be from Earth. I mean, that's kind of a wild thing to say. You're saying something non-human could be causing these things? And the answer is, in the realm of theory, yes. I'll give you an example. According to Einstein, there's this principle of time dilation which has been proven over and over again. And what it means is, if I travel at very close to the speed of light and or I get very close to a very strong gravitational field like around a black hole but not in the black hole, I can slow down time. How much? If I flew fast enough, just under the speed of light, I could uh, go travel for 30 years and return to Earth 200 million years later. So let's suppose you had some ancient civilization on Earth that had super advanced technology and for whatever reason left Earth, you know, went out for 30 years of their time and popped back here 200 million years later. You know, we might not necessarily have found uh, paleontological traces of them, uh, especially if they covered them up. <laughs> uh, and they could be, you know, th they wouldn't be human probably. They might be something else. Maybe there were super intelligent octopi or something. Who knows? Um, and then we get into another exotic possibility. There are um, a lot of reputable scientists, Adam Frank and uh, uh, Lovelock, uh, John Lovelock or another, who posit that life itself is intelligent. In fact, more intelligent than the humans and all the other individual creatures and bacteria that, and plants that make it up. And they go into evidence that this could be the case. One, one such line of evidence is that the Earth, through biology, has kept the climate conditions on Earth within the acceptable ranges. Did you know that the sun's radiation has doubled in the last billion years? The temperature of the air and water has not. And its biological processes, such as algae causing little particles to go in the air, which cause cloud formation, or reflect sunlight, and so forth, to keep that the case. So what if somehow, and this is really far out, but not so far out as ETs maybe, that maybe uh, we have this intelligent entity on Earth called the Earth. 
And it's very, very smart, and it's doing all sorts of things to, for its own reasons, which we can't understand. So um, this is one of the really important points we make in our book, that when we come up with lists of it must be A, B, C, or D, and we've ruled out A, B, and C, therefore it must be D, maybe we forgot E, F, and G because we couldn't imagine them. You know, what I like to tell people is imagine a color you've never seen before. You try it. You can't. But what if the UFO phenomena are like a color we've never seen before? Something that's real, but we can't imagine. And so I think we should not be too quick to come up with lists, cross things off the list and say whatever remains has to be the truth. We have to be brutally honest with ourselves and say maybe we're just not imaginative enough to come up with the correct list. Uh, and I'm going to tell a quick story about Marvin Minsky. Some of your sure. listeners may know that name because he was the father of artificial intelligence, and I knew him quite well. And we used to have, you know, these kind of discussions you had in the dorm on pot, you know, about the meaning of life and stuff when you were 20, 21. <laughs> and I said to him, Marvin, do you think humans collectively or individually are ever going to be smart enough to understand nature in its entirety? And he goes, of course not. My cat is the smartest cat I've ever met or heard of, but I'll never teach it French. What makes us think that we're not like that cat trying to learn French in trying to understand the UFOs? What says that our intelligence has evolved to the point where we can understand all the alternatives or understand what we're seeing? And so um, I think that that's one of the new angles that we take in the book is we take uh, readers on a journey where we go to the very edges of what the human mind can imagine and then we go beyond them to give you the feeling of what would it be like to be a super intelligent creature that can imagine what to humans are unimaginable. So that's, that's one of the reasons we call it the new science of UFOs, uh, you know, because... That is uh, part of the, the approach we're trying to take, that we have to be humble and accept we may never understand this. It's absolutely, absolutely amazing. Eric, let me thank you so much for your time today. Again, this has been just mind-bending, all of these possibilities. You, you have definitely gone beyond A, B, C, and D. So let me close by asking, uh, I believe it's called The New Science of UFOs. Do you have any idea when this goes to publication? And what's yeah, we're coming gonna, up? It, it's going to come out um, in probably February. We want to do a day and date. I'm going to be one of the main talking heads on a new series on UFOs called The Alien Files Reopened. Oh, wonderful. And this is going to air, I think, at least overseas on A&E. And uh, so I want it to come out about the same time. But, uh, Tim, as we'll, uh, soon as it comes out there, we'll shoot you the information. You'll be able to get it on Amazon. The book oh, is absolutely. the first draft is done. My wife is uh, busily beating on me to make it more understandable. <laughs> and so hopefully we'll be done like that within about a month. Eric, let me thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun.